welcome back to the Gentleman's Romantic Book. This week we've reached the end of Bear by Marion Engel, where good old Lou is at it again. As the summer winds down, she believes she's found love in the arms of her friendly neighborhood bear. But how much longer can she and her fishy friend maintain their taboo tryst? Bears, boys, and a breakfast for two here at the Gentleman's Romantic Book Nook. To the GR Book Nook, a journey into love and literature. Uh, with you, as always, is myself, Mac Monty. And I am your other co host, Lucky. Nice to see you all again. We're here with the final chapters of Bear. It's over, and I have to say, I feel different. I definitely feel different after exploring this book with you. I feel satisfied. Mm, mm, that's a, mm. that, that word, um, it, it's tough to hear, it's tough on the palate after just kind of the the end of this book. I do have to say, though, I feel that, you know, we'll obviously get into the more specifics, but it was a nice full story for Lou. I was going to say, it is a full, it is a story that has a beginning, a middle, <laughs> and as we found out this week, it does have an end. All things end, I think, would be a good lesson to learn to, to pull away from this, is that no matter how bad things get, no matter what sort of relationship you find yourself in, it's all going to end someday. Wow. Yeah. And um, with that somber note, I think we should get into some of the review. Yeah. Chapter 16 ends with the second coital bear, coitus interrupt bearus. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Bearus interruptus. I, I don't speak Latin, but she had sex with the bear a couple times. And now this is the concluding episode of the story. This is our final episode on bear. And... Um, it is a bit of a doozy. It's kind of an emotional roller coaster that it takes us on, chapters 17 through about 22. I would like to mention also that she has oral sex with the bear, a point that becomes important later on in the chapters. Crucial point in the last six chapters. A crucial, crucial point that will not go away. Um, I find it interesting right after we get this moment of kind of Lou has agreed now internally that she's just going to be sleeping with this bear. This bear is part of her. This is something she'll get, she's going to be doing. The next chapter, we go away from bear love and get back into racy human encounter. The flip-flopping in this book is incredible. Yeah, these chapters were... I'd, I'd say the first the first two sections of bear we read were very pointed. Like the first one is like, uh, bear, uh, Lou's loneliness, heading out to the wilderness. What will she discover there? She finds a bear. And then the second part, she's like cross the line with the bear. And now that she's crossed the line, she's just like dancing all over the place on the other end. She's letting uh, personal truths uh, slip out to the reader that she had held really closely before. She's starting new relationships with, um, how do I describe them? Non bears. <laughs> I'm glad you were able to find the words. I know that was a little tough for you. Um, yeah, and the first time this really happens is when Homer comes over right after this second coital encounter, as I guess we're calling it, with the bear, when Lou needs to move some chests out of her basement to look at. I I did not like the way Homer came off in this chapter. This chapter, before, before we get to Homer's, like, horrible behavior at the cabin, she goes to see Homer, and, like, Homer does have a wife. And apparently nine children, including two that they had adopted. That was, like, not only unnecessary, but shocking. I can't believe the amount of children this man has. I, I, I can't believe this piece of information was withheld from us, and all of a sudden, he's this married man with incredibly mobile sperm. It's incredibly confident of Homer to make this move after revealing, oh, I have a huge family. My wife does hate me and thinks there's something going on between us. She, his wife, uh, who is, we'll call Marge, <laughs> sees right through Lou's, like, she knows something's going on. As soon as she, like, sees Lou for the first time, Homer's like, I gotta go help her with something. She's like, there's something queer going on up there in those cabins. I can't quite put my finger on it. <laughs> but I think she she might know. You know, I think maybe she's been through this rodeo like another girl falling in love with that bear, Homer. Don't try and save him. <laughs> it's so funny to me that 
while reading this book, I think every time somebody was suspicious like this, immediately my mind went to, oh, they know about the bear. Not that anything else could possibly be happening with Lou. I never, never assumed there was human interaction going on. I was thinking she was all bear all the time. Uh, but yeah, so Homer ends up at the cabin to try and help her, like, lug some trunks out of the basement to help with her research. And um, he just, like, starts hitting on her. She, she starts trying on some of these, like, elegant dresses that she finds. And um, I guess one of them, she sort of starts to blame herself later on because it's a very revealing dress with, like, she. I think she says something about, like, her cleavage hanging out or her breasts hanging out, which um, I don't think they were actually hanging out. I think it was just, like, a low-cut dress, which, like, she is, that, like, shows that she's still in, like, a rough place because she's still making excuses for herself of why a man would treat her like that. One breast actually does come out in this moment. There is a point oh. in moment where one of her breasts does actually fall out of the dress. And Homer's like, don't worry, I've seen it before. It's all good. Like he moves on past that. Lou ha tries to have a conversation with him about breasts, which I do want to mention. This is the first chapter where I kind of started seeing Lou as a little bit of a skis. Yeah, she comes out of the book changed but like once we learn everything about lou it's like it's a little bit again i think i'm talking about this in episode one a little hard to like her mm -hmm. yeah but so she's she's trying to have this conversation with him about her breasts which he's pushing off yeah here on page 90 i found it lucky um breasts were not homer's subject he began to talk about the marina business he told her <laughs> about the marina business <laughs> she, he told her more about the marina business than she would ever need to know. So she's got like one boob hanging out. It's like, Homer, what do you think of me in this low cut bodice? And he's like, well, the boat's this year coming in nice. But what you don't want to do is pull a diesel into a cold engine. And she's just like, I don't, is that a euphemism? Talk dirty to me, please. And it never really comes across that he's that much of a charming man, I think. Like she's, she's having these attractions <laughs> to him because of the past with the director that we've talked about before. Her issues that are brought up later, I think, with previous relationships. At no point is it really mentioned that she's like, damn, Homer's looking like good in that top. No, she doesn't like have vivid descriptions of Homer's muscle. We don't get any kind of description actually of like what Homer really looks like or why she would feel the need to like be all breasty with him. <laughs> you know, I, you raise an interesting point there about how she's bringing a lot of baggage from her previous relationships into every like current encounter and it's 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 like, it's like if you get if you're in a relationship with someone who treats you weird you might then bring you know it's that psychologically impacts you in your current and future relationships so you know if you've been dating say i don't know a wild animal for the last two weeks you're gonna like she probably thinks homer she's just like shut up and just go down on me <laughs> how much honey do i have to slather on myself to get you to that is a perfect transition because i would like to bring up the case of sexual assault uh bear versus lou because yes 100% this bear is not consenting nor enjoying what is happening other than the treats that he's being enticed with yeah. from Lou. Uh, let's just, uh, just for those who didn't read the book for whatever reason, um, Homer comes over and they do not have sex. She, he like sort of is forceful with her um, and is kind of like, oh, a bit of a tease. And she sort of ends up kind of kicking him out of the house. Um, and then she immediately goes and yeah, uh, I guess the word of this would be like consent, which she does not get from the bear. Um, it, never in the book does she get consent, but even less in this, in this chapter. She uses honey, which based off of our previous recording is just a really, really hard pill to swallow for how poignant that was. <laughs> um, but like, but she's using this sugary treat for a wild animal t to do things to her. Like, I don't, that's not, that's very, very not okay. Not okay. Uh, it, this book really ruined honey for me. I went, I had some toast the other day. I went up to grab it from the shelf and it was inside of the little plastic bear. And, ah! Started having like flashbacks to this is the vertically <laughs> ridged tongue. And I'm just like, Ugh. uh, yeah, this, ch it's funny. Cause she, um, I don't, it's not actually funny. Um, no, it is not. But uh, during this section, yeah, she rubs honey all over herself to entice the bear. And, uh, she like fondles his bear testicles this passage obviously struck me too. It struck me in the sense of, you know, she's, the bear's not down. She, he's, he's not attracted to her. He, she consistently says he, his, I don't remember specifically the wording. He, he's, his bear packaging is not coming out of the envelope as it were. Yeah. Okay. So she said oral sex with the bear and then she's like, tries to go all the way with this creature and like, can't get the bear hard difficult for me to talk about um but you know that's okay everybody it happens to lots of bears uh performance issues are common men of men and animals of a certain age 
Um, it's, there's other things you can do, which is, I think, a good lesson from this book. You don't have to. Anyway, that's a topic for next week's relationship advice. So. Erectile bear function. <laughs> Please do not call the episode erectile bear function. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is why um, you shouldn't let me edit. Uh, I, I want to jump back. I don't want to, but we, I want to go. There's something I want to touch on with the honey scene, the, 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 the honey pot part two of this. And uh, she puts the honey on herself. And the bear of like, loves the honey. He eats the honey off of her, but then wanders off. And I love the way that she des- uh, Marion Engel describes the bear. Uh, she put honey on herself and whispered to him. But once the honey was gone, he wandered off farting and too soon satisfied. <laughs> then at the top of the next page, she says, eat me bear, she pleaded. But he turned his head wearily to her and fell asleep. She had to put a shirt on and go back to work. We do learn a lot more about Lou in this section. Um, some like fortunate and unfortunate things in her past. She talks about how she had like, she found, she found cucumbers cold. She's like, she's talking about her past and trying to like become sexually fulfilled. And she's like, she found cucumbers cold and women left her hungry for men. And the men left me hungry for bears. (laughs) She did get around quite a bit. I mean, she's been painted in this sense of being very sheltered and not really having a lot of these sexual experiences. But we've come to find, as these chapters go on, she's had a lot of sexual experiences. She's, like, done a lot of things and been up there. I don't quite relate to her on this sense anymore that I did in the beginning of the book. Yeah, because I think she, like, it's, like I said, at the beginning of the book, they paint her as sort of, and she paints herself as kind of this cold figure who hasn't felt a human touch in years. But she's had this affair with her boss. She was with this gentleman who was kind of manipulative to her. And I, the book kind of glosses over this relationship. Uh, it doesn't, it goes into a little bit of details about how he wanted to get engaged, but she refused. He was like cheating on her. And at one point he like makes her get an abortion, which I thought was like a decidedly dark piece of her backstory, which does explain a lot. It was put in parentheses, which I thought was incredible. Like such a small footnote. It swept that uh, emotional backstory under the rug. And I'm not, not that that would have been like a pleasant thing to explore, but it might've explained a lot of why she's kind of broken emotionally. Um, and I, I didn't, I wanted more of that relationship to be explored to explain why she's up in, uh, Quebec. Where, where does, where does this thing? Montreal, is? I thought. Mo- Montreal? Yeah, this point of the elegant lover, I thought was such an interesting, pretty much huge reveal. This, this reveal that she kind of went psycho bananas on this guy, I think really speaks a lot to kind of her reasoning because As with a lot of the relationship moments in this book, I think Engel uses this explanation to kind of justify why she's down with bestiality. I don't agree with this justification, but I think that's kind of what she's trying to do here. Agreed. She does go a little psycho bananas on the guy who, um, this is the, this is the, I would say her biggest, the biggest love of her life, maybe the biggest relationship of her life. Mm. Because after she leaves her for another woman, she like, graffitis his house with chalk and like throws some shit through his window really like a uh, kind of trashy behavior uh you know he obviously mistreated her and that's like that line about making her have that procedure it's like he's a pretty scummy person but then like i just never thought that lou would be capable of something like mm-hmm. that and i think it does kind of bring it around that like yeah this she's i guess i would classify lou and i wouldn't have done this before this um section of chapters but she's an unreliable narrator in that she paints herself in a certain light, but then sort of casually reveals these things. It's almost like when you're talking to a person, like you ever meet someone out in public and they're sort of telling you about their lives and you're like, oh yeah, telling you about their mom. And then they just start going off the deep end about their lives. And it's like, that's when I got out of rehab. And then my father fell in love with my girlfriend's sister. And it's just like, you start realizing more and more about this person. You start getting a clearer picture of who they are. And it's kind of scary. Uh, We are getting in my, two in my opinion, And maybe I've been desensitized by previous chapters, but to the grossest encounter between Lou and the bear is not, I guess non-sexual might be the term for it, but it doesn't involve any genitals. She, uh, just a little bit after she can't get the bear up, she like is trying maybe exploring these different avenues of being in love. Because constantly throughout these chapters, she's saying, I'm in love with the bear. I love the bear. I've come, finally come to terms with the fact that I'm satisfied with the fact that I love this bear. And at one point she's like makes out with the bear. Their tongues touch. She, this is the part that grosses me out. I, this is like the most stomach churning piece. Cause I knew that there was, I knew that there was going to be sex and stuff, but I didn't know that she was going to literally like put her tongue in. She like talks about how the bear's gums feel from her tongue. And then here's the part, this, I think it's worse too. She, they share a bowl of cornflakes on the ground. She pulls a giant bowl, 
cornflakes <laughs> bear brought to you by Kellogg's cornflakes <laughs> with like some fruit and honey, of course. And then they're like, eating, they're lapping it up together on the ground. Oh, I was just disgusted. Cause I wouldn't share a bowl of cereal with my best friend who is lucky here. I wouldn't share a bowl of cereal with you. I wouldn't. You're my friend. You know, I wouldn't, I would never just pour us both a big bowl of cereal, let alone a wild animal. That would have to be a really big bowl for me to feel comfortable sharing out of the same bowl with you. And even then, I'm still uncomfortable with that thought. If it was an Olympic-sized swimming pool <laughs> filled with tasty Kellogg's cornflakes. You know, I do want to mention, before we started this episode, we were wondering how are we going to work in our Kellogg sponsorship. I'm so glad we found it naturally. <laughs> Their lawyers are going to be on the horn with us immediately <laughs> following this episode. Uh, if you want to get a hold of us to sue us for Kellogg's or anything else you think we've said wrong, uh, grbooknook at gmail.com. That's how you can get a hold of us. Uh, we're on Instagram. We're on Twitter. We've got a website. We've got a YouTube channel going now. Uh, follow us. We want to hear from you. Yeah, definitely hit us up um, if you've got some cool thoughts on Bear or um, our upcoming books, uh, which we'll get to in the next episode. Um, feel free to hit us up. We'll um, maybe read your comments on, on the show. We want to hear what you're I want to hear what you're thinking. Yeah, we want to interact with you. Let us know. We'll, hey, well, maybe we'll uh, we'll read your jokes out loud and take it as our own. I want to talk a little bit about the fact that Lou calls this bear God, because that is such an unsettling moment for me, where it goes from like lover, which already was a tough word to read, to this idolization of this creature that definitely does not show sexual interest in Lou. Yeah, she puts the bear up on that pedestal for sure. It's a problem, I think, with, um, not a problem, it's a problem for Lou, for sure, that she's been reading all of these notes that fall out um, of these books that the, the carriers were doing. And um, there's tons of mythological references about bears in different cultures. And I think that's sort of what puts the idea in her in her head. And maybe this, you know, maybe this is to Marion Engel's credit. This is like something that Lou's always done is put these people that she's in a relationship with above her. Like the director is her boss, this man that she, you know, she was so into this man that she wouldn't get engaged to uh, that she, as soon as he left, that she was, you know, she must have built him up to be this great person because as soon as he looks to someone else, it just, like, devastates her and, like, breaks her. Yeah, she talks about um, the uh, Ainu, the, I don't know, I'm probably saying this wrong, but the Ainu people of Japan, where they literally do worship bears and, like, they kidnap bear cubs and have them feed off of women's breast milk, and then at two years old, they slaughter the bear, which um, is disturbing in its own right. But then her takeaway from that story is, you know what? <laughs> The bear that I'm having sex with is a god. <laughs> yeah, she really paints that story the way she needs it. So there's a part, I think, right after the idolization that is kind of the breaking point where she kind of becomes, I would say, almost a sexual predator. Because this is the first time in the book we hear or we see the word bestiality written in any moment. And this is the time where she physically gets on top of the bear and tries to dominate it, which was just a crazy, crazy decision by Lou. It makes you wonder, like, I mean, she's obviously broken at this point, and she's, like, trying now to, yeah, like, she wants this full, this full sexual experience with the bear, and uh, the bear is just, like, not interested, and I think she becomes to this realization that she's put him so much on the pedestal that he could never live up to this, because it's, it, 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 she puts so much personification to the bear and what the bear was thinking, what the bear wanted from her, that now it's just, she's seeing it, I think, finally as like a wild animal after this. But it's almost like, it's sickening and a little sad to see her so desperately trying to, um, you know, mount the bear. And for me, that justification isn't really there because, you know, like we're saying, we're finding out so much about her past where she does get attention sexually. She is able to be in relationships and find them, but she's so desperate she needs to physically try to dominate a bear. Like, I, I it's just, there's a disconnect there for me in the development of Lou. I think it's really interesting that we get this kind of dream metaphor where this devil is speaking to her about like how terrible she is, what the things she's doing wrong, the bestiality, the things she should go back on, like the director and whatnot. Yeah. What an interesting way to kind of uh, put Lou's insecurities in a concise, like three paragraphs. Yeah. She has that guilt dream and uh, really starts to look at herself through a more critical lens, which you think would have happened maybe the first time you let a bear put his tongue in your vagina, <laughs> but you know, better late than never. I always say, Wow, that was really hard to hear you say. Um, but you're absolutely right. We can't dance. Okay, we can't dance around the, the sex scenes of this. But you know what? The good thing is, Lucky, 
every sex scene that we discuss after this one is gonna be a smooth sailing, crystal clear. My butt just unclenched for the first time in six weeks. You're so right. Oh. <laughs> with a rusty <laughs> like a haunted house gate swinging open a little bit yeah I heard a ghost flew out it was very spooky if you're thinking of going into this butt <laughs> don't yeah that's the tattoo on the left cheek I won't tell you what's on the right one that's for book two um, I, do, <laughs> I do want to touch on Lou's guilt because I think before she even stops wanting to have sex with the bear and trying to she has this um, fantasy about the bear eating her, destroying her. I mentioned a quote earlier where she's like, tear off my head, bear, pull my head off. And she's saying it very casually, not in the throes of ecstasy, you know, but uh, and even here is here's a quote from page 103 that she, she tries to have sex with the bear. It doesn't it doesn't work out. Um, bear, she would say to him, tempting him. I'm only a human woman. Tear my thin skin with your clattering claws. Great alliteration there, Marion. <laughs> I'm frail. It is simple for you. Claw out my heart, a grub under a stump. Tear off my head, my bear. Which, like, in itself is a beautiful poem, but then in the context of the book, you're like, what do you want? Is it, like, yearning for this destruction, you think? It's, like, yearning for his like, animalistic, carnivorous nature. I thought it was so interesting that she keeps asking the bear to, like, kill her. Yeah, I don't understand the desire there, why that is the sexual experience she's looking for. But, obviously... This book was not written for my specific sexual proclivities, so there's maybe something I'm just not connecting with in general. You know, the French call the orgasm the little death. That has nothing to do with this book, but <laughs> interesting nonetheless, I thought. <laughs> Such good heat you're bringing. I'm loving this. <laughs> <laughs> just some unrelated trivia. There. <laughs> Lou does, I'm happy to say, have another sexual partner in the book uh, other than the bear. And we finally, finally, finally get to it uh, here. I don't remember the exact chapter. Chapter 20, 21, I think. Uh, chapter 20. Chapter chapter 20. Yeah, I was jumped in the gun a little bit. Um, do, you, do you want to walk us through that, Lucky? Not really, but it is our responsibility as the co-hosts. So after this guilt dream where Lou is admitting bestiality to herself and kind of having this emotional understanding of what's been going on to her a little bit more, she feels very, very guilty and that she needs human compa- companionship. Um, very guilty. Mm-hmm. She needs something a little bit different, a little bit less violent. Um, change of pace. A little change of pace, something a little bit <laughs> calmer. And uh, she, so there's a, okay, there's a lot that happens during this sex scene that I just, I have qualms with. She, first of all, talks to Homer's wife to find his location. And in this scene, his wife, without really even caring, kind of just points her to the direction of Homer, who's off by himself. Mm-hmm. at the mill or the lumber yard yeah she brings some liquor up to him at the lumber mill to um wet his whistle mm-hmm. and, and really i mean she doesn't describe it as this great romantic scene which is something i thought was going to have a little bit more in romance it was it was pretty much like they got a little bit drunk and then took their pants off and got down to the dirty deed Engel also i think this this experience happens very quickly and obviously it was a breath of fresh air to see some human on human interaction the- I had that exact same note. I said it's it's a breath of fresh air to see some human on human. <laughs> I did I did appreciate that. It was down and dirty, very quick. She also takes a long time to explain how hairless Homer is, which I thought was very interesting <laughs> that this man, this man has no hair on his body anywhere. And it is very important you know how different he is than a bear. Well, compared to the bear, I mean, we're all pretty hairless, right? Like, we're all hairless twinks compared to a fucking bear. That's true. It's it's an it's an inappropriate standard to set himself to. Uh, and, you know, uh, Homer sees right through this. He even tells her at one point when they're getting close, he's like, you stink of bear, he said. Well, I guess I do. There's no way of living with him except living close to him. And then he's like, people do get funny up here. <laughs> so he knows. He's got an inkling. She stared at her. You're right about the hairy thing. I just thought this great quote. She stared at Homer's hairless ears and thought of his hairless body. Shuddered. <sighs> Absolutely she him, savage. She likes him fuzzy. She likes him fuzzy and hairy. It's so mean to Homer too. But that's okay because I don't really like Homer and he puts himself in this kind of terrible misogynistic light throughout the whole book. So the fact that she kind of slams him there at the end is pretty funny. Yeah, at one point he's like, a man has, when he's trying to seduce Lou in the first uh, scene, the first earlier chapter, he's like, 
oh, a man has needs, a man can do what he wants to spoil your wife, then Lou says, your wife might have needs, and she's like, I'd kill any man that came near my wife. Like, well, that's sort of a double, <laughs> double-edged double sword there. Yeah, I think there's a lot of moments where there's this powerful powerful commentary on the expectations of women in this time, where, like, that's yeah. a perfect example, where he's like, I can do whatever I want, let's have sex. If my wife does it, the man is dead and she's divorced. It's incredible. That's interesting, because in every encounter that Lou has had, she's sort of been... I don't want to say taken advantage of because that takes away some of her agency, but like she's the time that she lives in sort of doesn't really allow for her to step into that role of being in power. And, you know, maybe that explains again, a little bit of why she approached. The, I'm, I'm just trying to find some explanation about why she would, hey why man, she would go in for this. I'm right there with you every night before I close my eyes, I have to think about anything else. Uh, I did look up some reviews for this after we finished it up. I was on Goodreads and I found one, I thought was funny. I want to read to you. Um, this is a four star review of the book. And uh, it says, yes, she becomes sexually involved with a bear. But if you read the entire book and that is your takeaway, I'm not sure what to tell you. <laughs> I would like that. They, they didn't go into what they found in the book. That was the entirety of their review. I'm so curious what the person discovered from it, because I think we've talked a lot about Lou's discovery. And in this last section, the discovery that I was feeling very connected with her about has been kind of shattered. <laughs> I, what other takeaway is there? And I mean, how could you describe the book? Ask, what's, what is Bear about? And if you started saying, well, it's about a lonely woman who is just trying to find herself, you've already misled the person that you're describing the book to. Yeah. The book is titled Bear. That is what it is about. <laughs> and yeah, the bear does function as a metaphor. It's not smut. The book, the book's not meant, the book certainly is not meant to make you turned on or aroused. If that was the point, it would fucking failed on my count. I was going to make a joke. But I really don't want to make a joke about getting an erection reading this book. My family listens to this podcast. <laughs> I got the opposite of an erection. You remember that <laughs> scene in The Wizard of Oz when the house hits the first witch and, she, you know, Dorothy takes the slippers off and her, her the, the, the feet curl up. That's what my penis did while reading this. It curled up in on itself. It's like, whoop, well, nope, that's gone. Now I'm never having sex again. Never eating cornflakes again. Never eating honey again. This book just, like, raised the fields of my life. I will always purchase... Kellogg's though, best best damn cereal out there. Um. <laughs> uh, did they make raisin bran? Uh huh. No, I fucking well, love raisin bran. Bread. <laughs> Kellogg's brand raisin bran. Hit me up. Send me that palette. Uh, so yeah, she hooks up with Homer. Is really satisfied. Well, not really satisfied, but she enjoys having that like penetration in that specific part of her body that we won't mention anymore. They, like, wrap it up pretty quickly. It's a pretty swift chapter. Like, all the sex scenes, it sort of, like, rolls through. And um, after that, that's definitely, like, a turning point that she's not going to be able to go back to that, like, worshipping of the bear. That definitely shatters it for her. And the bear. She It's funny because Homer's like, you smell like a bear. And she's like, well, I guess I do. And then after she fucks Homer, she goes back to the bear. And the bear's like, you smell like... She's like, the bear smelled man on me. So I just left him to it. And it's like, okay. Mac... I'd like to talk to you about the erection. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think that this, obviously it's the, what, the second to last chapter of the book. So I did not expect this to happen. Yeah, after Seven pages from the end, no. God, especially after we kind of have this moment, right, of realizing like, well, sex with a human was great. <laughs> I get it. And We're moving to cheering for her at that point, like, yes, you're headed in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Help big a man cheat on his wife. Not great, but better than what you were doing mm -hmm. two chapters ago. Uh, well, first she describes about how she knew she knew he was growing a fat. of. Uh, oh, my God. She, Thank you for she knew he was this. growing a plug of fat in his anus against hibernation. What is that sentence even? That is that, is the, that is the craziest thing I've ever read. And like, I can't. I put the book down for a solid five minutes because I was just thinking, like, is that real? Is that an indicator of hibernation? That is real. Oh, my God. Because uh, bears spend so much of their time sleeping through the winter like lazy bums. They don't want to have to get up to take dumps all that time. Uh, and so, yeah, they eat a bunch of, um, not garbage, but, like, they'll eat, like, roots and shit to block up their, well... She knew he was growing a plug of fat in his anus against hibernation. I think Marion Angle puts it better than, um, you know, Richard Attenborough ever could. You know, I, I do have to say, coming out of reading this book and what just happened, at least I learned something. No matter what, I did learn something new. He sat up across from her, rubbing his nose with a paw and looked confused. Then he looked down at himself. 
She looked as well. Slowly, majestically, his great cock was rising. It was not like a man's tulip shape. It was red, <laughs> pointed, and impressive. She looked at him. He did not move. She took off her sweater and went down on all fours in front of him in the animal posture. I'm not going to keep reading. Um, actually, I will. He reached out one great paw and ripped the skin on her back. At first, she felt no pain. She simply leapt away from him, turned to face him. He had lost his erection and was sitting in the same posture. She could see nothing, nothing in his face to tell her what to do. This is the moment where the bear has completely lost all humanity to her, and she sees it as what it's always been, a wild animal. It's a literal wild animal that she is presenting herself in front of in a home. It is absolutely insane to me. because it's claws, paws, expanding jaws. Love that. That is a rap waiting to be written. It's incredible that like she she... She already has the moment with Homer. She's moving away, but she's still like, ah, one last fling, maybe. Like, this is the moment. She did it. She moved on. And it took the bear attacking her to finally get that through her fucking head. When I was reading this chapter, I was, I literally said out loud, oh, no, Lou, <laughs> don't. Because she, had, she had, I hit that turning point. And uh, this isn't, but I think this needed to happen. She needed this wake up call, this realization. Because if she had left, like, pining after the bear and promising to write him over summer break, that that would not have worked for me. I mean, we would have had Marion Engel's second book, Bear 2, Back to Bearness. <laughs> it's just... <laughs> and then the third book, Bear, where the E in Bear is a three. <laughs> <laughs> That's where the money is, though, the third in the franchise. Uh, so terrified, she basically runs away from the bear, gets the bear to leave the house, um, starts, like, being afraid of the bear, which she should have been from the moment that she learned that there was one on the property. And then, yeah, basically, it's just like, I need to, I need to leave. She realizes that she's got to move on. Yeah, and this really brings us to the conclusion of the whole book. Just the final pages, <laughs> the ending, just tying it all together. She sort of is like then longingly going around the house and packing up her things. Um, at one point, she says that she goes to the um, she goes back to check on the bear's like hut or whatever. She stood at the doorway of the bear's old fire and inhaled his randy pong. Uh, so she. She fucks Homer, she tries to fuck the bear, and then she gets the hell out of uh, the wilderness. That was a really concise way to describe the entire book, I think, for our <laughs> listening population. Yeah, yeah. if you just listen to that one sentence, you do not need to read Bear. Honestly, um, like that, I'm, I wouldn't have the nightmares that I'm having had that one sentence been all that I had to read of this. But, you know, we read this incredible story. I, I do have to say that while I didn't agree with Lou's reveal of her history, it was a nice, concise full story for Lou. She was there for the summer. We got the timeline right at the beginning. We get mm -hmm. to see some growth of hers and some change happen in her and she leaves better for it. If you break it down to its core pieces, you've got a character you can relate to in some ways doing, getting into trouble and sort of resolving that in some, it's sort of back ended with the resolution and she has changed in the end. And those like, that is the function. We joked earlier, it has a beginning, a middle and an end. That is like a pretty basic story. So it does function as a narrative and as an emotional arc. And it ends on a pretty, I don't know, about sweet note, but I really did like the last line of the book. She's driving away from this whole experience and feeling fulfilled somehow, like she's onto something new. And this is the last line of the book. Uh, it was a brilliant night, all starshine. And overhead, the great bear and his 37,000 virgins kept her company. The end. Dot, 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 question mark. I wrote that last bit in just because I you know, want to leave some room open for future stories. But you could do like a fanfic of like a second book when she goes and confronts the director. A traveling circus comes through town. Things get a little hairy. <laughs> so now that we've read the entire book, we've um, we've digested the chapters. We've grown. We've changed. Yeah, I got some indigestion from this chapter. We, yeah, we we were trying to digest maybe. Um, I guess, what would you rate this book? If you had to give this book a rating in general, do you, do you have any thoughts on like a recommendation or rating? Would I recommend this book? It's short. You could, you could probably read it in an afternoon. It's a bit of a roller coaster ride. Um, you know, I think considering everything, the book gets a solid four from me. Mm -hmm. I feel conflicted. Because I think that, yes, it's a quick read. Um, yes, it does fall within the romance genre. Subject matter's a little rough. The characters, I feel, aren't super fleshed out as the story continues on. And I'm kind of disappointed at some of the, takes and, the twists and turns. So I'm probably going to have to give this one 
like uh, I don't like a seven. Honestly, if you hear about the book and you're on the fence, read it. Because you'll know right away if you don't want to read the book, yep. right? Like a woman has a sexual encounter with a bear in the book. Regardless of anything that surrounds it, you could have fucking Romeo and Juliet, but in the middle she has sex with the bear. That, that is all you need to know about whether or not you're going to read it or not. Because it didn't turn me off. I, I wanted to read this book. Well, okay, this book did turn me off, but it didn't turn me off from reading it. And um, I don't know that I'm better for having read it, but I'm better for having talked about it with my best friend for the last four weeks, which has been a great experience. I'd rate our discussion of it at, a, at, a, at an even 12. An even 12. That's a, wow, almost a baker's dozen. You know, it really was a journey into love in literature. And I think that is just incredible. We, we, we experienced something new together. And I think our listenership and we are better for it. All right. So on that note, uh, is there anything we want our listeners to know with the schedule, our upcoming book, and the future of The Gentleman's Romantic Book Nook? Canceled. After, <laughs> tragically, after one book, PETA has put an end to the tyrannical reign of Back and Lucky. <laughs> it was quick, but uh, it was fun wielding power for a while. Buried under a bevy of lawsuits and bestiality controversy, <laughs> Mac and Lucky were forced to leave the States. Hey, at that point, to go to Canada where we'll be appreciated. At that point, at least we're in the newspaper. Uh, no, we're going to keep reading. Um, I picked Bear, and I think, Lucky, you had some ideas for where we're going to go uh, after this. Yeah, so talking a little bit about the future moving on, we're going to be having another episode out in two weeks. I will be bringing two books to the table for Mac and I to discuss. We'll be talking about the author, the fan bases, the genre mix, just everything to kind of make a decision between the two of us. We will be deciding at the end of that episode, so you will be able to pick up that book and, as always, read along with us. We'll also be talking about reading schedule and plans moving forward for the podcast in general. Um... Again, if you would like to reach out to us, you can uh, you can email us at grbooknook at gmail.com. Send us a DM on Twitter. We're pretty bored. I think all of us are pretty bored right now in the current state of the world. So hit us up. We want to talk to you. Yeah, if you're enjoying the show, uh, please leave a review on iTunes. Uh, I don't know if Spotify allows for that function, but um, iTunes, you can give a rating. Leave a review of what you thought. Maybe you loved it. Maybe you hated it. If you hated it, you know, what the fuck are you doing listening to episode four? You should have stopped a long time ago. Um, or you're my mom who both hates the show and is still listening. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but you know, if you like the show, I think the most important thing you could do is just tell your friends about it. If you know someone who uh, likes romance novels or preferably doesn't, um, just tell, you know, recommend the show. We don't advertise in any way and we rely on a lot of, um, word of mouth to get it spread. And uh, if they want to join in on a fun book club, they can send them our way. Frankly, we can't afford advertising with all of these lawsuits, but you know, it would be great if you could <laughs> share share this show with your friends so we can get above water that is going to do it for us here at the gentleman's romantic book nook uh we're all done with bear next week we're going to be hearing about a couple of extra books um lucky is is it would it be too much to ask for like a little little teaser oh a yeah little, well just a little peek at what you're what you got cooking up over there you know i obviously i don't want to tip my hand i do want it to be a surprise for everybody and keep our listenership up but uh let's just say we will be spending a little bit of time in a galaxy far far away it's not a Star Wars fan fiction. It's not that. I promise. Okay. I was it's not say, mine. It's, I've, I've, I've read Leia and Ray's beach vacation from you too many times. <laughs> How many drafts do you need to go through before you publish? Like 69. Yeah.